talking about, well, we read about the article titled Monkey and the article titled Ape, or the entry in Britannica. I want to start out with just this funny thing that we human beings are classified as primates. So if anybody ever says, what do you mean we evolved from primates? You shoot back and say, huh, we are primates. Now, who did this to us? Put us in the primate category. It actually was this person, Linnaeus, who lived a long time ago, but still affects our lives in weird ways. Does anybody know what Linnaeus did to us? Besides putting humans in the primate category, yes. King, I don't even remember. You probably had to memorize all these kingdom, phylum, blah, 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 genus, family, order, species. I don't remember. Can anybody list them off real fast? Were you taught them in order with an acronym or something? Maybe this is too long ago. Anyway, he's the one who gave us that classification system. And so, like I said, we know, I may not remember him, and he lived a long time ago, but he still affects our lives. And he put humans, oh, by the way, Linnaeus was a creationist. He was born and he died before Charles Darwin was ever born. So when he made up that system, what he thought he was doing, what he was intending to do was to kind of classify the creatures according to what he believed was God's divine order of things. So interestingly, before, before there was really this kind of notion of, of evolution, even Linnaeus and some of the other Europeans at the time uh, saw that as they came more into contact with some of these non-human primates saw that there were, you know, a number of similarities between the primates they were observing and what they eventually called the human primate. Now, there's been a lot of shuffling around of these classifications, and a lot of them have been redone based more on evolutionary similarities than, you know, Linnaeus was working off of kind of morphological body. To, he was He didn't have the genetics to help him out. Um, and other people didn't. So you, you, some of the some things like morphological similarities, like body type and stuff, can it doesn't necessarily imply evolutionary similarity because different creatures can adapt to similar environments in similar ways. So you know there, these relationships have been reworked. But the point of the matter is here we have this kingdom phylum order, especially genus species classification, which was given to us. Uh, before evolution, but it turns out to be quite useful for evolutionary relationships. Now, there's, I'm going to, in this class, talk to you about several things to watch out for. On the one hand, there's kind of this idea that we are not similar at all to our primate relatives. But on the other hand, people then go overboard and want to believe that we're just like the monkeys. And I just want to caution you that humans are not just like monkeys. And in fact, we are also not just like the other apes. Dan, before this class, monkeys, apes, what do you think? You're nice enough to tell us that you thought monkeys and apes were the same thing, right? Which is, it's not unusual. It's good to be, it's good to know that and put that out there, right? Because, but they're not actually the same. Now I put other apes in there because, well, Lexi, you said something that was surprising to you and maybe surprising to me too. When we talk about why did I say other apes, like humans and other apes? Who are we? Where are we classified in? We're classified with the great apes. <laughs> we're classified with the great apes. Now, again, that's not saying we're just like the great apes. I don't want to be just like the lesser apes either, but we're not just like them. 
But, you know, that's technically where we're classified in. I don't know if Linnaeus did that to us. That's more of an evolutionary relationship. So, although we are not just like these other creatures, we do share some evolutionary similarities with both monkeys and apes. Our closest, our closest relatives, our closest living primate relatives are the chimpanzees and the less known bonobos. And for a long time, people didn't know what a bonobo was because they're relatively rare and relatively isolated, um, but they turn out to be a, a different species. They're not the same species as chimpanzees. Um, and so uh, we'll talk about that speciation a bit, but they're our closest living relative. Also fairly close are the other great apes, the gorillas and the orangutans, but they're not as close as the, evolutionary speaking, as the chimps and bonobos. And then relatively close to, but a little further away, the poor gibbons who we call the lesser apes because we don't like them as much. They're smaller. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I always thought it was kind of mean to call them lesser, but they're, you know, they probably don't care. <laughs> further away from us, right? are what we call the old world monkeys. So they would be fairly distant, evolutionarily speaking. They're getting pretty far away, the old world monkeys. And furthest away, now it's getting kind of, kind of really distant away, is the new world monkeys. Now, let's start with these monkeys. There's a real, there's a little bit of a problem with the terminology here, um, which here's the world. What is the old world? Yes. Um, like Europe, Asia, and Africa. Yeah. So when people say the old world. It's actually a term that comes to us from Europeans when they were starting to do what they considered to be exploring. And so they came up with this idea that they were in the old world. And then they included this as part of the old world, all this old part. And they said that the new world was over here. Now, this is a little bit how to say it's a little bit it's not the best terminology because it implies that you're kind of in a you know that, that this is this is all new it has this kind of idea that that there weren't weren't the same kinds of civilizations and people in the new world as there were in the old world so there are some people that are trying to change this terminology but unfortunately for things like monkeys and other things, it has sticks around, but a lot of people don't even know what that means. And so it's kind of hard to, to figure that out. So this is uh, from the Wikimedia Commons. So old world monkeys are in the red. And as you can see, they really should be called African and Asian monkeys. Because they're not, I mean, the Europeans invented the term old world, but there are no sort of, that's not part of the natural range of the old world monkeys. We see old world monkeys in this part of Africa and part of Saudi Arabia and the Middle East in India and Indonesia, this part of the world and Japan, the famous macaques of Japan are really interesting uh, old world monkeys. Um, and then, of course, the New World monkeys really should be called American monkeys, although maybe they should be called mostly the Amazon and the tropical areas of South America and this part of North America, although some people refer to it as Central America because we like to make ourselves special up here in the United States. But the New World monkeys should really be called the Americas, the monkeys of the Americas. And the old world monkeys should be called sort of African and Asian monkeys. So that's their natural range. The old world monkeys is where 
uh, monkeys seem to have evolved and then they got over into the new world and were into the what is now the what is the amazon and started evolving there um most people believe that the way they got from here to there i don't know if this is going to sound right it sounds a little crazy is a large floating like vegetation raft now this, like I said, it sounds crazy, but we've observed these things happen. So what'll happen is at the mouth of a, or at the end of a river, vegetation and dirt and stuff starts to accumulate and then it can all break off. So you can have this sort of pretty large floating mass. And this distance is not as far as you might think. So, you know, and there's some little islands out here. So, you know, I mean, it's still, I mean, it's hard to figure figure this out but it seems that there was there was a, a divergence here in which the new world monkeys started doing their own thing over in the americas the new world monkeys are technically called the platyrenes that's their scientific name but the funny thing about platyrenes is it sounds complicated but it just describes their noses. <laughs> Alexa, what's the deal with these noses of the New World monkeys? Do you remember which ones are which? Um, I know that the Old World monkeys, their noses are more like ours. The New World monkeys are different. I can't remember. I think the New World monkeys are more squished. More squished. Exactly. That's what we like. The scientific name for more squished is platyrenes, flat-nosed or broad-nosed. So they're the flat-nosed primates. Like I said, they really should be called the American monkeys. All of the New World monkeys are all arboreal, which means they're all up in the trees. They are pretty small in size, usually, body size. All of them, well, well, they all have tails, but some of them in the New World have these things called a prehensile tail, which is a tail that can curl around and has an extra grasping function. So you can use the tail to grab a branch and swing with that one. Or use the tail, I think it said in the article, you can use your tail to grab a peanut. So I guess that's useful. <laughs> It's actually kind of an old thing. If you've ever seen an opossum with its prehensile tail, it's kind of yuck. Anyway, they also, uh, so they have, some of them have prehensile tails and they don't have opposable thumbs. So I can't demonstrate what they don't have because that's what we have is an opposable thumb, a thumb that can grasp and they don't have it. As I said, these monkeys we're doing their own thing from about 30 to 40 million years ago in the Americas, in the Amazon and the and South America, those parts of thing of the world. So they they split off, they diverge from a common ancestor, and then they evolve and descend and change and all these things. And there's a few pictures of them. Some of the, you know, the, the famous spider monkeys and the capuchin monkeys. There's that curling tail. To me, these are all kind of funny looking. They're kind of goofy. They like to screech around and be in the trees and prehensile tail you. And they're small and they got those squished in noses. And so, you know, I honestly can't get upset if somebody goes to Costa Rica or goes down to the Amazon and sees one of these monkeys and is like, you can't tell me I'm related to that. And I'll be like, no, you're not that related to that monkey. I mean, pretty far, you know, I still have those eyes and they're pretty smart. They do, you know, but they're, they're pretty far away from us. They're pretty goofy looking. At so... We can compare those with the, the Caterines or the old world monkeys. 
Now again, catarrhines is just a nose term for sharp nose primates. Ones that have more defined noses, not the stupid squished in noses. We want sharp noses. Many of the old world monkeys are arboreal too, although they don't usually do as much swinging. They might walk in the trees and do branches. Some of old world monkeys are live on the ground. They're basically terrestrial baboons. Some, some baboons are on the ground monkeys. They don't, there are no prehensile tails in old world monkeys. They're not into prehensile tails. Don't need them, not as much tree swinging. And in general, they have a larger body size. Many of the old world monkeys have opposable thumbs. So they can, you know, do different things with these thumbs. Cheyenne, how smart are these old world monkeys? What'd you say? They're pretty smart. Yeah, I mean, you know, getting up there in the smartness. Solve a few problems here and there. Not the big problems, not like you, but the small problems. The Catarines is actually a classification that includes the old world monkeys, the apes, and humans. What's interesting is that one of the things that we share with old world monkeys and apes is the same dental formula. We all have the dental formula of two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars, or two, one, two, three, which is interesting. Evolution, you know, you don't want to make too much of these things, but you know, it's just a little interesting fact for you. Again, the old world monkeys were not evolving with the new world monkeys. They were doing their own thing. They were, they were evolving and continued to evolve in Africa and into the Middle East, into Asia, in that range of things. So there they are over there. There are some, you know, the baboon, the vervet monkey, the proboscis monkey. There you go, there's some sharp-nosed primates. Getting a little more serious, starting to sit on the ground and think about things, solving problems, thinking about others, you know, getting a little more serious there. So, as I said, we see this divergence between the monkeys of Africa and Asia and the monkeys of the Americas at about 30 to 40 million years ago. And as I said, you know, evolutionary time, it's difficult to wrap our minds around it. Fortunately, we skipped up 20, 30 million years from the asteroid. So for those of you who wanted to start from the beginning, we are moving fast. Then there is another divergence between the apes and the monkeys. Uh, and this is, again, all in the old world or Africa and Asia. At around 20 to 30 million years ago, we see some, some creatures that we would call that look more like apes emerge. Maddie, what's the quickest way to tell uh, apes and monkeys apart? Uh, well, that's sometimes hard to tell their intelligence apart because you'd have to ask them about that. But there is a quicker way if you're just looking at them. Mm. Bowden? Tail. tail. <laughs> the tail part. No, apes don't have tail. There are some monkeys that just have little nubs and so you have to look at them too. You don't want to look at them that closely. But the apes, you know, they don't have a tail. There's no tail. You're right, too, that most of them are larger. They're larger size, right? And they are, uh, there's actually far fewer species of apes. So the monkeys are like all over the place. There's like over 200 species of monkeys, as you saw. There's all kinds of 
strange looking weird monkeys, but there's maybe 20 ape species in existence. And some of them are, are subspecies of say, I think there's two, two species of gorillas, for example. So it's, you know, it, it, there's, not, there's not a lot of apes. There may have been more in the past. I didn't know if I want to talk about this this early in the morning, but Kendra, what else is interesting about apes and monkeys and humans? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's different menstrual cycles that they have. Some of them are, which are pretty comparable to human menstrual cycles, especially in the bonobos and chimpanzees. Like I said, it's too early to show you guys any of this stuff but if you want to look sometime on youtube you can see that bonobos especially if they're held in captivity and get bored they start having a lot of what crazy different kinds of sex with each other they have pretty broad sexual repertoires and everything humans do they do and more and so it's like you know but like i said this isn't really something they do all the time if they're in the wild but if they're in like a setting where they don't have much to do they tend to you know, and it seems to be kind of a tension release mechanism. So if there's something that they might want to fight over, instead of fighting over it like food, they'll like they'll just all have sex and then have food. <laughs> like I said, you can look this up later. I, sometimes I show it to you, but you know, it's kind of uh, it's. Uh, Oh, and they also, you know, there are, there are many monkey and ape species which will only have sex when their menstrual cycles are lining up, when they're in estrus or what we call in heat, I guess. But, you know, so they'll only have sex when there's a reproductive chance. But with bonobos, it's like all the time. It doesn't matter, reproductive or not. So, you know, there's another species which is just known for its having sex when it's not reproductively necessary. But um, yeah. Oh yes, and they are smarter. The apes, the apes are smarter than, they're smarter than humans. Akil, how do we know that? What do they sometimes do? What are those apes able to do? Well, yeah, they can't really, they, they don't, they don't speak, but they do have different vocalizations, different call signs, communication. And in, we've also taught some of these apes like gorillas, how to use sign language and bonobos and chimpanzees, how to, you know, make signs and communicate in this way. It's not super sophisticated, but pretty, pretty good, you know, about as good as a two-year-old. <laughs> which is terrible but there you are and uh james what else can they do use tools so they have some tools um i don't know i don't want to make it sound there like they're swinging hammers around or anything although they can if you give them one um but in the wild they have fashioned what are called termite fishing sticks and various sort of implements out of leaves and sticks. And, and so outside of kind of the, you know, I mean, obviously, actually this was first observed by Jane Goodall, the very famous and still living climatologist in the 1960s observed tool use among chimpanzees. So in some ways it's strange that we don't know this more because it was observed a long time ago. So again, we're not trying to say that they will be swinging hammers around. Although the thing is, if they come into contact with human tools and human stuff and see people using it, they will also start trying it out. Yeah, I saw a video of another guy using a saw using a saw i think i'm about to show you that same video but not as long maybe two and a half minutes of yeah. it yeah and you might be tempted to say well yeah but they can't make a saw which is true but when was the last time you made a saw <laughs> right you didn't make a saw somebody gave you a saw and then you started using it so you know i mean maybe some of you made a saw but like you know the idea of inventing a saw 
I didn't do that. I probably wouldn't come up with it myself, but somebody handed it down to me. So, you know, yeah. They are much, they are much more afraid of us than we are afraid of them. <laughs> Their range has been much reduced. Most of them are actually in, in danger of, of extinction. Yeah, they're not going too far. So chimps and bonobos are mostly in this part of Africa. Orangutans and gibbons are in this part of Asian Indonesia. Actually, it is it is sad how many of them are, are threatened or, or near extinction, but that's their contemporary range. In the old days, it would have been a larger range. So this is kind of a, a pictorial version of what we were talking about with the evolutionary divergence between new world monkeys and old world monkeys and then the gibbons and then the orangutans the gorillas the chimpanzees the humans going back and forth. or you can look at it kind of this way which is sort of focuses in on the orangutans branching off here from about 12 million years ago the gorillas maybe 10 here and then like i said there was a there was a later speciation event or well there's never a speciation event there's processes that take time between what are now, what are bonobos and chimps. So they look a lot alike, but they're actually uh, different species and have some different behavioral and patterns as well. And our most recent common ancestor is of, with those is six to eight million years ago when these creatures started to diverge, go into different habitats, develop different lead. Um, and, you know, well, let me just start with some more bewares. Whenever we look at a monkey or an ape today in the world, they are still evolving and they have evolved. So, how to say? The chimpanzees of today and the bonobos of today and the monkeys of today are not the same as what would have been the common ancestors back in the day. So we really should call them ancient monkeys, or if we have them fossil monkeys or ancient apes, they're not the same. And in fact, chimpanzees, for example, have developed, have, have, have evolved quite a lot. A lot of the features of chimpanzees that we see today were probably not present six to eight million years ago uh, in that most recent common ancestor. Now, they are enough like monkeys that we call them monkeys, or they are enough like apes that we call them apes, but they're not the same. And so we don't have, we should be careful about that. It is not that somehow they went to the Amazon and then they got stuck there. And they're like, shoot, man, I can't be an old world monkey because I'm stuck in the Amazon. No, they were there and then they adapted to new and different habitats and they continue to evolve. The monkeys that we see are not trying to be apes. They're not like, oh, those apes are better. They can use those saws and I can't use a saw. So I'm going to try and be an ape. I'm on track. If I can just evolve enough. And like I mentioned, the gibbons, we call them lesser apes because we don't think they're as great as the great apes, but they're not trying to be great apes. They're not sad that we don't call them great apes. They're not on a track to be something else. They're just trying to adapt, survive, evolve, thrive, you know, in their own world. So if we eliminated all the, let's say we got rid of, well, maybe what if we got rid of all the great apes? It's not like the gibbons are going to be like, all right, it's my turn. I get to be a great ape now. I'm going to grow into this thing. Or if we eliminate, if all the humans go away, it's not like the chimps are going to be like, all right, take this over now. I mean, you know, they might be happier, but they're not going to evolve into, into humans. We're not on a track. None of us are on a track. This is a very deep, very deep presupposition.
is the idea that all creatures can be ranked by how smart they are. And a lot of you talked about the smartness, and we do talk about smartness. Now, smartness can be good. It can help us do things in the world. We can do different things if we're smart, right? But I'd like you to contemplate a little bit if smartness is an evolutionary advantage. For one thing, being smart is often costly. You have to have this big head and you have to give it a lot of food to feed the head. You know, so, you know, it takes a lot of evolutionary energy to raise dependent children to this level. I mean, you're in college. Look how long it's taken before you even become productive members of society. The evolutionary cost is tremendous. Maybe it's too much. So that's one thing to think about. But remember that in, evol in terms of evolutionary advantage, the only thing evolution cares about is reproductive fitness. That is, is this something that helps people reproduce? Now, when you went out on Saturday night, Are you looking for the smartest person out there? <laughs> right? I mean, you know, if smartness was an evolutionary advantage, then this classroom would be this super sexy place where you're all checking each other out. <laughs> and the club scene would be dead. I mean, it's like, what? who cares? Right? You know, I don't know. So just watch out for this idea. I mean, you have to wonder who came up with the idea that intelligence could be measured on one scale and you could take a test and give you a number and then we could rank you or give you a grade and that should somehow sum up your life. And then we put it out and put it onto all the creatures of the earth. I mean, in some ways you might say the monkeys are doing better than the apes now, except for us. Evolutionarily speaking, they're probably in better shape than the apes. And actually, when it comes down to it, what is the most evolutionarily successful organism out there in terms of its numbers, its spread, its reproduction? Yeah, I mean, oh, right. crabs? Crabs are doing pretty well. They'll probably be around for a while, but uh, go smaller. Rats? Oh, rats, yeah, they're they're rocking the world, yeah. Maybe not mountain mice or- Mosquitoes? Are <laughs> mosquitoes, yeah, they're doing pretty well too. Although we help mosquitoes out a lot because we give them lots of breeding ground. So without us, they might they might not do as well. Well, actually- This is because Getting down there, yeah, bugs. Bugs are there, although the poor bugs, they're also you know, a little bit, they've been declining because we don't like them and so we spray for them. And we're bacteria? So... Bacteria are the absolute most successful organism on the planet. They are gonna be here after everybody's gone and still be doing their bacteria thing. In fact, you as a human being have growing in you, on you, around you more bacteria cells than you have human cells. We are basically just walking around hosting lots and lots of bacteria and we need them to do various things. For those of you who are paying attention to your gut biome and the microbes in your gut and your gut bacteria, which is seriously important for your health, without those gut bacteria, we're done for, we can't digest food and survive. So some of them are good for us anyway. You have to wonder who came up with this idea of using intelligence as a measure for everything. I wonder who did. I mean, in my, I wanna be able to laugh at this person <laughs> <laughs> or people. They sound like nerdy people who didn't do very well in the clubs. <laughs> However, unfortunately, I think it was much more pernicious than that. It was people who 
wanted to keep other people from breeding, the people who they thought were less desirable. And they wanted to sort of sort those people out. And so it's been a, you know, that's why I say super beware. This is a hard idea to get rid of because it's very entrenched in our life. So that, but we also have super, super beware. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this actually kind of came up in the last class. And so I wanna really address it. All of us as human beings, we are all equally evolutionarily related to both chimpanzees and bonobos. Remember the bonobos and chimpanzees split off after the most recent common ancestors. And the reason I say that is there is not an individual person or a group of people who are more like chimpanzees or more like bonobos or more like apes. We are all in our own evolutionarily distance from them. We're all evolving together. We are all in the same evolutionary boat. There are not people, individuals, or groups evolving at different speeds. And this has been, again, a, a terrible thing that has been done. Uh, and it's a misunderstanding and misuse of evolutionary principles. So just be careful with it. Um, humans, as we began to diverge from some of these other ape species, evolved as one interbreeding species across the range, the geographical range. And we continue to be, there are no species divisions within the human species. There are no isolated groups. There are no isolated breeding groups. Not only that, every time, that humans who may not have been in contact with each other come into contact with each other. They test out the biological species thing and start to interbreed and reproduce together. There's never been an instance where this didn't happen. So it's very important to realize that we are all evolving together. We are all evolving in the same boat and there, is no, there are no people that are closer or further away from our primate cousins and those kinds of things.